everyone. I'm Kimberly Guilfoyle, along with Juan Williams, Jesse Waters, Dana Prino, and Greg Uffeld. It's 5 o'clock in New York City, and this is The Five. <laughs> A breakthrough on immigration. A big meeting today at the White House between President Trump and leaders of Congress on both sides of the aisle. The American people got to witness this one, and it was pretty extraordinary. The president allowed cameras to roll for more than 45 minutes as he and lawmakers negotiated how best to reach an immigration deal. He's now open to an agreement coming in two phases. First, addressing young immigrants and border security with broader issues to be settled later. What about a clean DACA bill now and with a commitment that we go into a comprehensive immigration reform procedure? I have no problem. I, I think that's basically what Dick is saying. We're going to come out with DACA. We're going to do DACA. And then we can start immediately on the phase two, which would be comprehensive. Would you be agreeable Mr. to Mr. that? Yeah, I would like, I would like to do that. Go ahead. I think a lot of people would like to see that. But I think we have to do DACA first. Mm -hmm. The president thinks the legislation should be a bill of love and offer to take any heat for blowback set to come. 62% of the Trump voters support a pathway to citizenship for the DACA kids if you have strong borders. You have created a opportunity here, Mr. President, and you need to close the deal. If we do this properly, DACA, you're not so far away from comprehensive immigration reform. And if you want to take it that further step, I'll take the heat. I don't care. I don't care. I'll take all the heat you want to give me. And I'll take the heat off both the Democrats and the Republicans. My whole life has been heat. <laughs> I like heat in a certain way. I love the heat. There is still one thing he's not willing to compromise on. Is there any agreement without the wall? Uh, no, there wouldn't be. The wall has to be there. Have to, you need it. John, you need the wall. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. I'd love not to build the wall, but you need the wall. And I will tell you this, the ICE officers and the Border Patrol agents, I had them just recently up. They say if you don't have the wall, you know, in certain areas, obviously, that aren't protected by nature, if you don't have the wall, you cannot have security. You just can't have it. It doesn't work. All right, did you love it, Dana? He's like, the wall. <laughs> Andy Krause is just... It was, it was absolutely fascinating. And I have to say, like, in being in D.C., a lot of meetings are like that behind the scenes, and then afterwards, uh, both sides go to their own cameras and microphones, or they take turns, and they're actually much more partisan, and they're playing to their base. And what this, this did was basically, it was like watching um, a city council meeting on local access television, but you're actually in the cabinet room with the president and a bipartisan lawmakers who did not know that this was going to happen. And what I thought was interesting is that everyone actually was there and knew what they were talking about. Mm. One thing Dianne Feinstein tried to do, I thought was pretty smart and strategic, is she suggests, why don't we just do a clean DACA bill? And the president's like, yeah, that's great. And then McCarthy very subtly says, Actually, because that wouldn't include security, and we need security. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little risky to be openly negotiating like that, but I thought uh, amazingly refreshing. Also, I think that um, a lot of the hardliners, when it comes especially to Dreamers and DACA, have backed off. The Above the Fold front page story on USA Today included three quotes on the front page from far, I would say, pretty hardline immigration groups saying, if we need to do amnesty for children who were brought here uh, illegally and it's not their fault, Congress won't have any problem from us. So the president is really actually at this opportunity where he could do something. And what Lindsey Graham was saying is that your voters actually want you to do this, but we're going to need you to take the heat. The president says he's willing to do so if the right wants to come after us and primary us because we're going to vote for something that makes actual common sense. Mm. It's a far cry from where we were uh, on the campaign trail when it comes to immigration, but I think that if you can get to a good solution, let political bygones be bygones and just get it done. All right, Jesse the Wall. <laughs> Look like a very stable genius out there <laughs> around the boardroom <laughs> table. I like um, boardroom Trump almost as much as I like rally Trump, I but boardroom it. Trump is good. This is, he also used this line when he said fire and fury. Yeah. So when he goes like this, I, I think he's, everything's under control. He's kind of like the martini that gets everybody talking. He drove a lot of momentum at that meeting. I've never seen so much bipartisanship. Dana says it's always behind closed doors. I've never seen that kind of wheeling and dealing among both sides like that like ever that. before. It was an incredible scene to watch. The, the cornerstone of the deal is chain migration lottery, the wall and merit-based. That's what Trump wants. The left wants the DACA. They want the clean DACA vote. 
Trump almost fell for it and then got rescued. We say, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're not going to do the DACA deal unless we have some border security. The wall will be built. The chain migration is ridiculous. If we want to hire someone from HR, we don't call KG and say, you know, is your uncle in HR? That's not how we do it. I don't know why America does it like that. And then the lottery. America is not a roulette table. I don't know why we're playing chance with our immigration system. We should use our brains. And then merit-based, he said, that's what Canada does. I thought the liberals loved Canada. We want to emulate their health care system. Let's emulate their immigration <laughs> system, too. But who knows? I, I think the Democrats are squirrely. If they do get anything clean, I don't trust that they're going to commit to merit lottery or the wall. That's why you got to do it all at once. So it's a risky deal. Like, But Trump said he's ready to take the heat. He loves heat. He loves it. <laughs> loves it. Almost as much as the wall. Okay, so uh, Juan, what did you make of this in terms of, you know, the optics that he's actually showing, giving the American people a front row seat to how these negotiations go, and also kind of like calling out people, like what are they supportive of, what are they not supportive, and also probably showcasing his intelligence and deal-making skills. Yes, it's his genius stability. <laughs> uh, so I think this is something that's been evident. I've written about this last month, that it's pretty evident that Donald Trump has opened the door to a deal, a comprehensive deal, because guess what? He's the one that set March as a deadline for the Dreamers that, to have a deal and said to the Democrats, let's make a deal. But he's been talking in hard terms, just as Jesse was suggesting, about the wall, about chain migration, uh, and these things, the wall is just not going to happen. I mean, not only are the Democrats not in the mood for it because they think it's ridiculous, but the Dreamers have been, if you recall, attacking Nancy Pelosi as she was speaking in San Francisco and saying, we're not a bargaining chip. Why are you doing this? But, of course, they held off in December. Now we have it front and center. The key here is that Trump wants a deal. He says what we have in common is both sides want a deal. The problem in dealing with Donald Trump, the great businessman negotiator, is when you come to the nitty-gritty, when you come to the fine points, he's lacking. He doesn't know the fine points. He just knows we want a deal, so let's make a deal. Mm -hmm. now, now, the problem has been, remember, the problem going back to George W. Bush in 06, the problem coming forward with Obama and the Gang of Eight, I think that was in 15, if I'm right, or 16, uh, is that you get the far-right talk show people saying, oh, my God, this is amnesty. This is amnesty. If you want to come in this country, you should get to the back of the line. These people should all be thrown out, like you're going to throw 12 million people out. And then they say, oh, this, this is just a matter of law. It's a matter of law. They broke the law. They're bad people. You know, it's just, it, it, the, the conversation devolves. And I think that's what Trump is going to have to experience. He says he'll take the heat. But even for a stable genius, Jesse, it's going to be a lot of heat coming from the right. Well, he loves it, and he's dealt with heat his whole life, Juan. So I, well, I I'm all for be it, fine. because I think he'd be taking heat principally from the Freedom Caucus and, and, and the Sean Hayes. You're like a Nixon goes to China. Only Trump can do it. We yeah, were joking that, that's around what he wants an immigration plan with love, and he can get away with saying something like that because he's talked about kicking out all the bad hombres. Yeah, the well, you yes. know, look, he just kicked out, right now, you got 200,000 El Salvadorans that, who were here as a matter of a, a, a voucher some kind of benefit because of the chaos in, in El Salvador. Uh, and then he's applied the same standard to the Haitians, the Nicaraguans. He has alienated just about everybody south of the border. Okay. And, and uh, I don't know if now he's willing to alienate uh, his hard right supporters. Okay, let's not alienate Greg on our border, <laughs> our border. I was just about to go do another show. <laughs> You're that versatile. <laughs> exactly. I loved it when he called it a bill of love. Because that explosion you heard afterward was Ann Coulter's head. Uh, <laughs> Trump is going to make a deal. You elected a deal maker, yeah. uh, and he's he's working the assumption that if you're for Trump, you will accept any kind of Trump there is. I happen to believe he's right because when you saw when you saw today, and I don't think you can under underplay what you saw today. What you saw today was something no president really has done. This is the most transparent presidency you will ever see. I mean, well, I can't say that because we haven't seen what's going to happen next when there are robots running our country. But he's a human cannonball. He jumps in, makes the loudest noise and the biggest splash, and then the pool settles, and then he figures out something that everyone can agree to disagree on or agree not to do or to do. He figures out the deal. But he gets in there and he makes a noise. This was a response, in my yeah. opinion, to the book. That's what I was saying. And, and the thing is, a lot of people are saying that as a negative. No, it was a response. It was a great response. Think about, the, think about this comparison, all right? Because this is the bigger story here. 
The media is chasing a mental health fantasy right now. They're chasing a mental health fantasy. Meanwhile, Trump is chasing a mental health reality. Today, he expanded coverage uh, for veterans uh, uh, for mental health because of the, the rise in suicides. This is to, to lower suicide rates. So while the despicable media is believing in some batty doctor who basically fell off the face of the earth after calling him a danger to society, and now she's walking it back. What's her name, Bandy? I can't think of her name. He's out there trying to help and save lives. That is an amazing contrast. But again, you got to go back to this meeting. That was really, everybody who watched it was transfixed, and it was pretty funny watching other networks admit, like, wow. this, is, this, is, this, is good. this is something good. Uh, and I'm also, I have to say, I'm really getting tired of hearing the word dreamers. We're all dreamers, all right? There's no dreamer privilege here. Just because your specific person doesn't make you a dreamer. Everybody in the United States is a dreamer. So stop calling a specific group dreamer. That's dreamer privilege. Wait a second. I just, what, what are you saying? Because these are people who I came I understand oh. what it is, Juan. Okay. What it is, it's, 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 it's a way of trying to separate it so that these people are disadvantaged and unique, but the rest of us are all bad people. No, no we're no, no, all no. dreamers. I'm not saying you just you. Just did it when you, no, you no, just told just, us about everybody who wants strong enforcement of the border is somehow hateful and evil. No, I didn't you just say did that. like four minutes of no, that. I, didn't. I, I said, practically I fell said asleep Demo during it. Run the tape. We have the videotape. <laughs> but I'm saying most Democrats oppose the wall because right. they see it as redundant and a waste of money. Because we have, That's in fact... That's not why they oppose yeah, I think that... There, there's no such thing as a waste the money. of money. Okay. There's no such thing to All Democrats right. as a waste of money. Okay. Come All on. All right. I hear the rhetoric. But I'm going to tell That's you something. That's not rhetoric. We have put History. more boots on the ground on the border. We have put drones in the air. We put electronic sensors. Which we have good. a better system. And with the moment, net migration is zero. So what you get for the people you don't want to call the dreamers is 62% of Americans I'm saying, saying all we of us need are dreamers, Juan. Well, I agree, but I'm, I'm just saying I'm, I'm it's inclusive. particularly unfair I'm to these of the, kids who I'm, came as children it was just against really brilliant their of the parents. Obama administration who brand who gave brand the, name the name to yeah. them as the yeah, dreamers exactly. because okay. it, gave, right. it, it, it it automatically Yes. evokes some sympathy. It's like the Clinton Global Initiative. Right, you always right. had to say, well, they do good work, yeah. but... I think it's just... time to retire that. I think what you're going to see is enhanced border security and a pathway to citizenship together because that's what Trump is going to do. Yeah. And right now, the shrink who said he was unstable is, is shrinking right now <laughs> because the right. people that are looking really small are the people who were talking about instability on other networks. You came in late, but you finished strong. <laughs> Way to go, my man. All right. my life. <laughs> More breaking news out of the nation's capital. We are getting a first look at testimony from the Fusion GPS founder about the Trump dossier. The developing details are out of a spy movie. You don't want to miss it. This is a Fox News alert, a bombshell revelation involving the Trump dossier. A lawyer for the founder of Fusion GPS says someone has been killed as a result of the publication. This development is part of a newly released testimony. It comes from a Senate committee interview with Fusion officials. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge joins us right now. Catherine, thanks for being here. What can you tell us about this? Okay, Juan, so this transcript is over 300 pages long. I have one section here that relates uh, to the claims that you're referencing. Um, it really is the kind of transcript you need to read a couple of times to fully get your arms around. But in the course of the interview, the lawyer, Joshua Levy, makes the claim that after the dossier was made public a year ago this month by BuzzFeed, that someone was killed as a result, but he doesn't provide further information as to who that individual was and how it was somehow connected to the publication of the dossier one. Well, we're also hearing, Catherine, that the FBI had a source inside the Trump campaign, even as the dossier was being prepared, and it therefore led them to think that some of the information dossier was credible. Well, that's right. So Glenn Simpson, who you just see there on the screen, he testified that uh, the British spy, Christopher Steele, who put the research together for the dossier, went to the FBI in July as well as sort of late September, early October, just before the presidential election because he felt he was witnessing a crime in progress based on the information he had about these alleged Russian contacts. And in the transcript, Glenn Simpson tells the committee investigators that Steele shared with him that the FBI believed or felt what Steele was saying was credible in part because they had, his words, a human source 
inside the Trump campaign. Now, since this transcript has been released, there's been a fair amount of pushback about that claim. Sources close to Simpson have told NBC News as well as the Washington Post that what he really meant was that the FBI had intelligence from the Australians and it related to that Trump campaign aide George Papadopoulos, who, as you know, pled uh, guilty to lying to the FBI. And that's really quite a bit different than what, in fact, is in this transcript, Juan. Yeah. Hmm. Catherine, thank you so much. You're we appreciate welcome. it. Kimberly, what do you make of the idea that, in, that what we know from this release is that Simpson, Glenn Simpson, the head of GPS, the Fusion, wanted this released because he said Republicans had been trying to undermine the investigation into Trump and the Russians. Yeah, I think this is a really pretty much a, a bombshell in terms. I don't know if people necessarily saw, you know, this coming and just what the repercussions can be of a situation like this. It, and it's it, there's been criticisms where people have said, "Oh, why are we continuing to cover this? Or why are we continuing?" We're saying, "Wait a second, we should cover it. We should chase down the facts and the details." And when you do, you find out information like this, and it really it doesn't it doesn't look good. I think it helps, you know, the president in terms of what he was saying about the optics of this and what the motivation was and that people were trying to get after him and do some harm to his reputation, to his campaign, to his potential, you know, presidency. But um, it's, it's really out of like a spy movie. It's like almost incredible. Greg, do, what do you make of it in terms of the idea? They say that, you know, according to FBI sources, according to the dossier sources, the Kremlin potentially uh, was feared to be able to blackmail Trump. I think that's what the Kremlin does with just about anybody in power. I don't know. I, I, I don't, I can't get worked up about it. If, bottom line, if you don't like Trump, then Steele is a whistleblower. If you don't have a problem with Trump, Trump, Steele comes off as a crank. The bottom line, I don't really feel that we've moved anywhere on this. I think the last thing America wanted was a 312-page transcript <laughs> on some dirt digger trying to set the record straight on his dirt digging. Thank you, Senator Feinstein, for making this available Feinstein. to Feinstein. Yep. Whoops. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, <laughs> you read this thing, they say somebody got killed, and there's no follow-up question. Yeah, like, right? hey, who? And there, nobody says who? It's like, that is a strange thing. And by the way, somebody got killed. Why would you say that? That was your way of saying, I don't want to give any more information out because I don't want anybody else to die. That's a strategy, and that sounds a little weird. Hmm. I mean, who, who, who is it? XKGB? Was it somebody carrying the, did they have a heart attack carrying the redacted whatever? I don't know. We don't know. Well, but, a lot of, you know, what's interesting here. That's next week. <laughs> yes, <laughs> tomorrow. What's, what's interesting to me is that suddenly people are taking the, the whole dossier a little more seriously, it seems to me. Really? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I think look, that's one thing that's pretty strange is you have a special counsel investigation that's ongoing. Then you have the House and the Senate, both are ongoing, and it's super confusing. Then you have the testimony from uh, Fusion GPS, and then an op-ed in the New York Times written by those mm -hmm. people Glenn from Simpson, uh, yeah. Simpson and I can't remember his yeah. co-partner, uh, co yeah. uh, his partner, saying that they wanted this transcript released, but then, the, of course, then they knew that 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 was going to be in there, yeah. that somebody was killed, and, like, of course, nobody wants anybody else to get killed, and it it's impossible for us to just, just wait for a conclusion mm -hmm. from the special prosecutor. I understand that, but I think we, it would behoove us to do so. But I'm saying, right now, a lot of people, especially people on the right, say this, this dossier has been proven to be scurrilous, to have no value. Instead, what you have now is Simpson at GPS and others and the Democrats on the committee, led by Feinstein, saying, hey, we want it out because we think, in fact, you will see that the FBI believes a great deal of this information. And if you look at people like Carter Page going over there and giving speeches for money, coming back, the George Papadopoulos connection coming, the information coming from Australia, it sounds like, oh, they had reason to believe the dossier, Jesse. I mean, I read all 300 pages, Juan, <laughs> so I'm an expert on this dossier. <laughs> yes, please. And I'll break it down for you. The headline that jumps out at me here is that Comey and Hillary paid a foreign agent for dirt on Trump. This guy was paid by the FBI. The FBI has been denying this. Now we have Glenn Simpson saying, yeah, this guy was paid. That's a pretty big deal to me. So this guy is getting paid by Hillary. He's double billing the FBI. And then he's shopping the Trump dirt to the mainstream media. Wait a second. Now was people paid, are dying. Was he paid? I think the FBI didn't say that they had paid him. They were thinking they, of paying They him. said they didn't. But now oh, you oh. have him telling these investigators that he was paid. So. 
someone's dead, usually the mainstream media, when someone dies, goes and chases this stuff down. I don't think they're going to do any of that. There seems to be little interest about the dossier. I think I'm interested in it because it's salacious. And you keep saying <laughs> that it was BS. At least he's honest. No, Juan has kept Malaysia? saying for the last month that the dossier, most of it's true. It is. I, tell me what's true about it. Well, I don't want to get don't into any get detail because I don't have it. But uh, I'm oh, just so you don't know. You, no, 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 no. So you don't know. Hang on. I was making the point, and I think the point was also made today, that the FBI believed this was a credible document, not because they were getting other information well, to confirm many elements in yeah, the document. They said Trump's lawyer went to the Czech Republic to have a secret meeting with a Russian. Turns out his passport has never been to the Czech Republic. That is just blatantly erroneous. Start there. Right. That was a mistake. Yeah. All right. So Jesse, I thought it was all true. Jesse right. comes out on top. Ahead, <laughs> President Trump weighing in today on all the Oprah for president buzz. Well, come on right back. We'll be buzzing about it here on The Fox. Jesse says he can't dance to that. He probably could have, but he chose anything. not to. All right, we're going to get to the segment. When President Trump threw his hat in the ring in, for election 2016, remember the Democrats snickered at the idea of a candidate from showbiz. He knows how to get attention. Uh, he's... You know, the classic reality TV character. And uh, at this early stages, it's not surprising that uh, he's gotten a lot of attention. We can't have a reality TV star that has no concept of public policy step foot in the Oval Office. He cannot have the nuclear codes. He is a reality TV star. He's very experienced at providing television entertainment. Uh, the presidency is not about entertainment. So you it's don't about care if for flowers decisions. is there? But now they seem to be warmed up to the idea of a celebrity with no political experience in the White House following Oprah's big splash at the Golden Globes. There are headlines like these all over the papers. The prospect of President Winfrey thrills Dems. This prospect also got a positive reaction from President Trump. Thank you. Yeah, Vito. Oprah would be a lot of fun. I know her very well. You know, I did one of her last shows. She had Donald Trump, this is before politics, her last week. And she had Donald Trump, and my family was very nice. No, I like Oprah. I don't think she's going to run. So, Greg, all of this is based off of one speech from yeah, the Golden Globes. But obviously, no, we, everybody's been talking about Oprah for a while. Um, and the battle for the Democrats' heart and soul is taking another turn. So do the Democrats want to go to the far left like a lot of the base wants it to go, or do they take a try with a TV star? Well, you can see her bumper sticker already. It just says... Win free and win is like uh -huh. in blue, mm -hmm. and then the opposition could be no bra, yeah. which would be good. <laughs> it's less about pocketbook than persuasion, though. I, you, you know, you can't say, "Oh, they've got a billionaire. Let's get a billionaire." Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. he's tall. Let's get somebody who's tall. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> My God. It's, it's about persuasion, and and I mean, I right. think that's what we learned. That's what I learned from this thing was that like. You got to be fast. You got to be funny. You got to be memorable, especially when you have a bunch of people up on the stage. Donald Trump is a historical figure in the sense that he's not a politician, which gives a message to a lot of people who didn't live their lives in order to become president or become a politician and therefore have lived less careful lives. And he has lived a less careful life and has managed to be president. Um, but for the Democrats, they should also be figuring out, not if it's Oprah or whoever, they got to get beyond identity politics, toxic avenging, and victimhood. That's their number one thing. Hillary thought she could ride that magic carpet of gender into the White House and went right into right. Trump. The wall. Um, the wall, the literally. literally. The yes. wall. Uh, Kimberly, do you think that Oprah would want to put herself through the scrutiny? Uh, that comes with running for office. You know, she might be excited by the all the talk about it and people kind of like the hype and excitement. Her Gail King, her best friend forever, said, "Oh no, she's not going to do it." But that listen, she's not going to 100% rule it out, but not really considering it. I wouldn't be surprised if she ran. I mean, Greg's been talking about it forever. That is true. And so who knows? But um, it was interesting the president's remarks about it, and he says that he, if she ran, he could beat her, and that, um, but that he liked her. He was on one of her last shows, showing that he's, you know, yep. big ratings grabber. So it's, um, he said it would be a lot of fun, but he doesn't think she's going to do it. All right. Well, they're telling me I only have a minute left, so I got to split it between you two. Uh, usually, the electorate wants to go for a polar opposite of whoever uh, was the president before. Is Oprah really the polar opposite? I think the polar opposite of Trump would be a short, 
thin Hispanic female from rural America. <laughs> I mean, I can't think of anything else. Um, you know, Oprah gave a speech about sexual assault, and now we're supposed to give her the codes of the nuclear football. I don't know about that. I don't think ISIS fears Oprah. And Trump actually tapped into something real. I think Oprah tapped into some Hollywood vibes, maybe that. And I don't want another campaign run on sexism, and it's going to be on sexism, and it's going to be on racism, because that's what the media is going to want it to be about. And the difference, though, between the Trump as a reality star and Oprah as a reality star, Oprah just gave away free stuff on her show. Yeah, everyone Trump gets made a car. people compete to get a job <laughs> on his show, so there's a little bit of a difference. Uh, Juan, is this all because there's, there's a vacuum? There's no clear leader, and so the Democrats are just trying to feel their way? Yeah, they are trying to feel their way, and I think there was such an amazing response to Oprah's speech on Sunday night at the Golden Globes mm -hmm. that they say, oh, my gosh, she has name recognition. She has money. Mm -hmm. I mean, she has billions. Uh, and guess what? People around the country, and we're, if we're going to talk about women, love Oprah Winfrey. So on all those scores, she would be a big plus. And even Donald Trump said Oprah Winfrey would be his number one choice for a vice presidential candidate. This is going way back. Now, my sense is, you know what? You asked a great question, Dana. People normally go somebody exactly opposite the person in office. If mm -hmm. you think of Obama as stable and a genius, they went to Trump, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Well done, and, and I think that if they're looking after Trump, the question is, are Democrats simply trying to fight the last war by picking out someone with great celebrity and great charisma? And I think that's right, because... To me, we still, as an American people, want someone who has policy experience, political experience, okay. who can make us feel safe in the world. Well, talk about polar opposites. Roseanne Barr is coming back to TV to reprise her namesake role and just broke some news about her iconic character. She's a Trump supporter. That's next. She can't control me. Oh, yes, I can. I am your mother, and I will control you to the day you die. I wasn't talking to you! Oh, yes, you were. Just then she was talking to me, wasn't she, Dan? You're talking to me? It's been more than 20 years since Roseanne went off the air. One of the top sitcoms of the 80s and 90s. But the Connors are coming back soon for a reboot in March, and we're getting word about one of the storylines this season. This family will be divided, like many others in America, right now over politics. Roseanne Barr just broke the news that her iconic character voted for President Trump. She says, quote, It was working class people who elected Trump, so I felt like it was very real and something that needed to be discussed, and especially about polarization in the family and people actually hating other people for the way they voted, which I feel is not American. Barr herself says she supports the president. Thought she may not agree with everything he says. Greg, did you even watch the show? No, but I follow her on Twitter, so this is no surprise. She is, uh, she is not afraid to uh, voice support for uh, the president among a, co a kind of a comedic world that uh, does, not, does not share her beliefs. So she is truly a radical in the sense that, you know, the, we, the, when people hear the word radical, they think unif it's uniformly left wing. But a true radical is somebody who zigs when you think they're going to zag. But there's always some kind of internal logic to the things that she does, and there is an internal logic to the decisions that she makes. But she's, but if you take two data points in her life, you cannot predict a third because she's that much of a radical or a rebel. The current crop of comedians, she's an icon. It must drive her crazy because she's not drinking the comedic Kool-Aid that they Jones for or Jim Jones for, uh, and she's that makes her the true risk taker, I think, in comedy. Her and. Like Dave Chappelle. I Do you would think say. the show is a risk by making it so politicized in this no, environment? No, I think it's a very smart business move on behalf of the network. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you think people are going to tune in, Juan? Are you going to be tuning in or not? I didn't tune in the first time, but I mean, it's <laughs> okay. interesting to me because I think she's onto something when she says, you know, she's going to portray a working class white woman who's a Trump supporter. And I'd be interested to see how she does that, if she can do it sincerely. I mean, the fact is, as she pointed out, right wing women tried to boycott the show way back because they said, oh, to have an opinionated woman uh, in that role coming from the left, they didn't like it. Well, now we'll see how they like it. I think it's going to do well, Kimberly. I think it is. I think it's refreshing. You know, she's always been a person of candor, and uh, she wanted the show, she said, the sitcom to be a reflection of uh, you know, her life and of reality. It's very interesting because um, one of her husbands, Tom Arnold, is a big Trump supporter, too. So. Is he? Yeah. 
Oh. Correct. I, that. I did wow. not know that. Well, you know what she needs? She needs a Trump tweet endorsing the show. <laughs> and I think that Everybody could be very imagine? helpful. See, good for business. There you go. All right, another college professor creates another race row on campus. Wait till you hear this one up next. <laughs> anyway, a math professor at Brooklyn College claims that merit-based education, meaning rewards linked to hard work and talent, is a tool of evil whiteness. In an article, Lori Rubel says colorblindness also holds back minorities because it doesn't admit that racial strife still exists. According to Campus Reform, the teacher recommends injecting social justice issues into actual math lessons. So I came up with an example. See, Sally is carrying six ski masks to an Antifa rally. She encounters four evil white males who steal two of them. How many ski masks does she have left? Answer, you're racist. But even social justice might not be enough here. Enlightened teachers may still think effort leads to reward, which again is very evil. Anyway, such conclusions turn a real problem into a bigger one. To deem achievement-based reward as racist suggests that certain students can't handle actual effort, and that becomes part of their identity, the kid who can't do what other kids can. I don't know. I don't think colorblindness or merit-based reward holds back students. It's teachers who seek to reduce education to mere identity politic algebra. This is no help for students once they hit the real world mm -hmm. where results matter, especially if you're looking for a raise. Facts have no feelings. And the more you focus on identity, the less you focus on other things that really matter more. That math is so simple, even I can do it, and I majored in sleep. <laughs> Dana, meritocracy is racist. Who knew? Mm, I did. We know now. I did. I knew. Um, but math is right. math. Math is math. Right? And I, I, I kind of don't like if, if changing the word problems helps <sighs> a kid figure out the answer to the fact problem, I mean, like mm -hmm. what the fact is, I, I don't have a problem with that. Really? Hmm. Jesse, thoughts? Uh, my thought is the opposite of meritocracy <laughs> is racist. How does she grade her papers? Mm. Does she say, oh, the Asian kid, I'm going to give him this grade, but the black kid, it's going to be another grade, but the Latino kid? You're not allowed to do that. I, I think that's almost, um, I don't know if it's illegal, but it's totally racist. And in sports, meritocracy works in sports. Look at the NBA. It's mostly black. It's because the blacks are the best players. They're just the best scorers. They're the best defenders. Or business. People in Wall Street, they don't care what color you are, as long as you make money for them. They'll hire anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, except, not for true. Short, except for not short true. people. Not true. Short people are often discriminated against, yep. Juan. I there's think studies that's a fact. that said, there's studies in the show, NBA. Yeah, in the NBA. <laughs> but studies show that tall people often get higher uh, salaries and get, jo get, uh, get jobs faster than short people. Yep. I should be. Well, then agreed. I need a raise. <laughs> <laughs> How high can we go? But I, th I think all the presidents are very tall white men, except for Obama, and he's a tall black guy. Right? Wait, wait, yeah. Oprah's next one. Oprah's She's going to break oh, the that's mold. True. That's true. Yeah, yeah, but I think, until television. I think your concept of meritocracy, well, though, differs from mine, because I think. What the suggestion is, is that people aren't trying hard enough or don't have the ability mm -hmm. to succeed. And of course, merit in our country, especially in the education realm, comes, you know, ACTs, SATs. Initially, it was to provide an additional screen to keep newcomers out of the elites in this society. But I will Wait, say that this. was the, what the SAT was for? Initially, yes. But, but here's the thing. I think that, in <laughs> I fact, never heard that. the impact, you know, the impact of this is so, it's enough to make you crazy because you hear from black kids, oh, it's acting white if you yeah. are a very aggressive, yeah. diligent True. student, and it makes me nuts. Yeah. But at the same time, then, you don't want people to making the assumption that, well, this kid's having trouble and maybe the kid's having some difficulties at home or in yeah. the school or whatever and can't do it. You want both sides to, I think, repeat what President Bush said, which is, uh, that would be the bigotry of low expectations and that we d shouldn't leave any children behind. What, mi mm. what say you, Kimberly? Um, you have a child. I do, and he's actually quite good at math. I find math hard. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> so that's I. just why I don't do word problems well. <laughs> My math is just hard. I was outstanding all the way up to algebra. That was fabulous. That fell apart. Something happened. Yeah, decent calculus, and then forget the rest of it. But you know, like... girl, women, they oftentimes discriminate against women in math. Well, I mean, it's fine. It worked out fantastic <laughs> for me, obviously. So I'm not going to complain about it. But honest to God, sometimes you're better at certain things than 
than others. But I hear what Dan is saying. If you want to like make it so that people can understand, the whole point is to learn and to make it and uh, put it in a way that is easy to understand. And maybe people are dyslexic or have learning differences, and the word problems are harder that way. I totally get it. I mean, but I'm not trying to go back and retake the SAT. Just saying. No way. But that you want to have real. uniform standards for mm -hmm. everybody, or else you can't Juice. judge. Juice. Right? That's yeah. discriminated yeah. the yeah. most. Oh. Let's be honest. The plain. And real quick, plain I want to correct my uh, my math. My math on uh, Trump's support. <laughs> So my math was bad on Tom uh, Arnold. I maybe he's a fan of mine, but not of President Trump. And I think I was getting confused. Tim Allen, who's not married you know what to Roseanne Barr, but is a Republican. Sitcom dads all kind of blend together. Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. yeah it is. It's like I can't. I get very confused on who. Like what's nice like John Bundy. Bundy. Yeah, 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 exactly. Oh my God! Remember that Married with Children? My, my favorite show. I, somehow I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder it was ahead why. of its time. <laughs> it's because it was the beginning living room of Water's World. It right? was, yeah, a, that was Trump before It was Trump. the opposite of uplifting, <laughs> but it was funny. All right, one more thing is up next. All right, it's time now for one more thing. Mr. Jesse. We have been searching long and far for a dog for Greg Gutfeld, Yay. and I think we found one. Oh, my goodness. It tells you to put the wine down. When you try to take a <laughs> sip of wine, it takes its paw and says you've had enough. That's there you go, Greg. you got to get yourself a dog he's like that. He's, not, no more, he's no, no longer more welcome. <laughs> You've had enough. Pest. That oh. dog would be back at the pound. You know how funny that would be? <laughs> yeah, if you, tra if, if you set a dog, gave me a dog and had trained it beforehand <laughs> to keep Could me from doing imagine? awful things. I knew you'd probably train it to do really weird stuff. Okay, Dana, what do you think? Okay, yeah. about that? No. no. <laughs> All right, so the Thai prime minister... Mm -hmm. His name is Prayut Chanocha. Mm, wow. Okay, Fantastic. so he may dislike the press more than President Trump or any world leader. The prime minister today was doing a press conference and he left a cardboard cutout of himself to deal with reporters in Bangkok. And he basically said, if you want to ask questions, you can ask this guy. But a lot of the reporters, they took it as a joke and they went and they took selfies with it and everything like that. Okay. This happens on the day when the committee to protect journalists announced their press oppressors award as a response to guess what Trump's fake news awards President Trump was named the winner of its overall achievement in undermining global press freedom wow. Trump was also named the runner up in the most thin skinned category losing the top <laughs> spot to Turkish president Erdogan and yet this is what happened today Thank you all very much Thank you, sir. I hope we gave you enough material. This should cover you for about two weeks. <laughs> oh my God. Well, he always seems to get the last word. I know, isn't it? He's, he's good at that. He's good at that. Well, today is a very special day. Having worked uh, for many years as a prosecutor in Los Angeles and San Francisco DA's office, I worked uh, hand in hand with some of the finest men and women in law enforcement. And today, in fact, is National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. And it's a day where we honor and appreciate the brave people who put their uniforms on every day to protect us, serve, and keep our communities and our children safe and our schools and the areas around them. And there's several ways. We have some suggestions for you all in case you want to um, show some appreciation. You can wear blue clothing, mm -hmm. Jesse, like a blue well tie. Right? It. Send a, ca a card of support to your local police department. Participate in Project Blue Light, which is proudly displaying your blue light in support of law enforcement. And so those are just a few ways. Or you can do what I do. You can, you know, they seem to like a hug and kiss here and there. <laughs> uh, the wives don't, though. Should I try that? The men and the women. <laughs> you can hug them. You hug them. That's what I used to do all the time at New Year's, Jesse. I saw that. So yeah. did everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> That was part of the segment, by the way. That's the one right. Thing with the that's, that was planned. That law enforcement. All right. What do you got for us? Uh, just before Christmas, there was a very touching story out of Dallas that I wanted to mention. Mm. Billy Earl Dade Middle School decided to have a father-son event. It was going to be the first of its kind in the school, and the school is predominantly made up of low-income and minority students. But they ran into a hurdle. They were concerned that many of the young men did not have father figures in their lives to bring to the event. So what, they put out a call to Dallas area men to stand in for the missing dads. They expected, you know, a dozen or people so to respond. 600 men showed up. Wow. And here are photos of this amazing event. You can see them talking with the young men, but also touching things like, here's how you tie a tie, son, mm -hmm. you know, and, it, and, and pledging that they will be mentors to these young men. So 
just That's my heart's great. out to those men in Dallas. So needed, so necessary, so wonderful. That's great. Ah, oh, very nice. Very well done. All right. Now great. to something not nice. Me. <laughs> uh, I have an article yeah. out on foxnews.com backslash opinion. We still have to say things like that. Backslash. backslash. Uh, and it's called How to Go to College Again. And what it's about is about how you don't need to enroll in any school. Just go on the web and listen to Sorry. podcasts. Because podcasts tell you more in a week than you can learn in a year. I talk about my favorite podcasts, so check that out. And I have a podcast tomorrow well, with thanks Ben. Thanks for the compliment. Yes. I'll tell you what. All right. What about Dana's I'm not podcast? done yet. What about Bill Hemmer's? <laughs> Griggs, how do you weigh a penguin news featuring 64% more penguins? <laughs> a lot of people ask me, how do you weigh a penguin? You, you entice it with a fish to get it on the scale. See, this is what you do, and that's how you, you get it. You entice it? You entice it with fish. How much does it weigh? Penguin uh, entrapment. Oh, yeah, yes, so there you on. go. Uh, <laughs> penguins are weighed uh, for a reason, uh, because it's... Um, they're very self-conscious about their weight. <laughs> very self-conscious about their weight. Is that the scale you use? Yes, it is. You have to entice them with a piece of bacon exactly. and a red wine. Yes. Oh. That's how I get them into bed. You you right I like to sleep with a penguin. So what? Disgusting. They're cuddly. Please smelly, help us. smelly. Such a DVR's never missed an episode of the Five Health.